a Wikivide Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Valerie Salonis Valerie Jean Salonis was an American radical feminist and author best known for writing The Scum Manifesto, which she self-published in 1967, and attempting to murder Andy Warhol in 1968. Salonis urged women to overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation and eliminate the male sex. She said her father regularly sexually abused her, and her alcoholic grandfather physically abused her and Salonis ran away and became homeless. She later came out as a lesbian in the 1950s. Working as a writer, she met pop artist Andy Warhol, and asked him to produce her play Up Your Ass. Warhol hired her to perform in his film, I, A Man. Early Life Salonis was born in 1936 in Ventnor City, New Jersey, to Louis Salonis and Dorothy Marie Biondo. Her father was a bartender and her mother a dental assistant. She had a younger sister, Judith Arlene Salonis Martinez. Her father was born in Montreal to parents who immigrated from Spain and her mother was an Italian-American of Genoan and Sicilian descent born in Philadelphia. Salonis said that her father regularly sexually abused her. Her parents divorced when she was young, and her mother remarried shortly afterwards. Salonis disliked her stepfather and began rebelling against her mother, becoming a truant, as a child. She wrote insults for children to use on one another, for the cost of a dime. She beat up a boy in high school who was bothering a younger girl, and also hit a nun, because of her rebellious behavior. In 1949 her mother sent her to be raised by her grandparents. Salonis said that her grandfather was a violent alcoholic who often beat her. When she was 15, she left her grandparents and became homeless. In 1953, she gave birth to a son, fathered by a married sailor. The child, named David, was taken away from Salonis and she never saw him again. Despite this, she graduated from high school on time and earned a degree in psychology from the University of Maryland. College Park, where she was in the Psychiana Society. While at the University of Maryland, she hosted a call-in radio show where she gave advice on how to combat men. She was also an open lesbian, despite the conservative cultural climate of the 1950s. She attended the University of Minnesota's Graduate School of Psychology, where she worked in the Animal Research Laboratory, before dropping out and moving to attend Berkeley for a few courses. When she began writing The Scum Manifesto, New York City and the Factory In the mid-1960s Salonis moved to New York City, where she supported herself through begging and prostitution. In 1965 she wrote two works, an autobiographical short story, a young girl's primer on how to attain the leisure class, and a play, Up Your Ass, about a young prostitute. According to James Martin Harding, the play is based on a plot about a woman who is a man-hating hustler and panhandler and who ends up killing a man. Harding describes it as more a provocation than a work of dramatic literature and rather adolescent and contrived. The short story was published in Cavalier magazine in July 1966. Up Your Ass remained unpublished until 2014. In 1967, Salonis encountered Andy Warhol outside his studio, The Factory, and asked him to produce her play. He accepted the script for review, told Salonis it was, well-typed, and promised to read it. According to Factory Law, Warhol, whose films were often shut down by the police for obscenity, thought the script was so pornographic that it must have been a police trap. Salonis contacted Warhol about the script, and was told that he had lost it. He also jokingly offered her a job at the factory as a typist. Insulted, Salonis demanded money for the lost manuscript. Instead, Warhol paid her $25 to appear in his film I, A Man. In her role in I, A Man, she leaves the film's title character to fend for himself. Explaining, I gotta go beat my meat, as she exits the scene. Salonis was satisfied with her experience working with Warhol and her performance in the film, and brought Morris Ajiradyar to see the film. 
Giardia described her as being very relaxed and friendly with Warhol. Salonis also had a non-speaking role in Warhol's film Bike Boy, in 1967. Scum Manifesto In 1967, Salonis self-published her best-known work, The Scum Manifesto, a scathing critique of patriarchal culture. The manifesto's opening words are, some authors have argued that the manifesto is a parody of patriarchy and a satirical work and, according to Harding, Salonis described herself as, a social propagandist. But Salonis denied that the work was, a put-on, and insisted that her intent was, dead serious. The manifesto has been translated into over a dozen languages and is excerpted in several feminist anthologies. While living at the Chelsea Hotel, Salonis introduced herself to Maurice Giridia, the founder of Olympia Press and a fellow resident of the hotel. In August 1967, Giridia and Salonis signed an informal contract stating that she would give Giridia her next writing and other writings. In exchange, Giridia paid her $500. She took this to mean that Giridia would own her work. She told Paul Morrissey that, everything I write will be his. He's done this to me. He's screwed me. Salonis intended to write a novel based on the Scum Manifesto, and believed that a conspiracy was behind Warhol's failure to return the Up Your Ass script. She suspected that he was coordinating with Giridia to steal her work. Shooting On May 31, 1968, Salonis went to writer Paul Krasner to ask him for $50, which he loaned to her. Krasner later speculated that Salonis could have used the money to buy the gun she used to shoot Warhol. As the shooting was only three days later, according to an unquoted source in the Outlaw Bible of American Literature, on June 3, 1968, at 9 a.m., Salonis arrived at the Chelsea Hotel, where Giridia lived. She asked for him at the desk, but was told he was gone for the weekend. She remained for three hours before heading to the Grove Press, where she asked for Barney Rossett, who was also not available. In her 2014 biography Valerie Salonis, Brian Fass argues that it is unlikely that Salonis appeared at the Chelsea Hotel looking for Giridia. Fass states that Giridia may have fabricated the account in order to boost sales of the Scum Manifesto, which he had published. Fass states that, the more likely story, places Valerie at the actor's studio at 432 West 44th Street early that morning. Actress Sylvia Miles states that Salonis appeared at the actor's studio looking for Lee Strasberg, asking to leave her play for him. Miles said that Salonis, had a different look, a bit tousled, like somebody whose appearance is the last thing on her mind. Miles told Salonis that Strasbourg would not be in until the afternoon. Miles said that she accepted a copy of the play from Salonis and then, shut the door, because I knew she was trouble. I didn't know what sort of trouble, but I knew she was trouble. Fass records that Salonis then traveled to producer Margot Fiden's residence in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, as Salonis believed that Fiden would be willing to produce her play as related to Fass. Salonis talked to Fiden for almost four hours, trying to convince her to produce the play and discussing her vision for a world without men. Throughout this time, Fiden repeatedly refused to produce Salonis' play. According to Fiden, Salonis then pulled out her gun, and when Fiden again refused to commit to producing the play, Salonis responded, Yes, you will produce the play, because I'll shoot Andy Warhol and that will make me famous and the play famous, and then you'll produce it." As she was leaving Fiden's residence, Salonis handed Fiden a copy of her play and other personal papers. Fass describes how Fiden then, frantically called her local police precinct, Andy Warhol's precinct, police headquarters in Lower Manhattan, and the offices of Mayor John Lindsay, and Governor Nelson Rockefeller to report what happened and inform them that Salonis was on her way at that very moment to shoot Andy Warhol. In some instances, the police responded that, you can't arrest someone because you believe she is going to kill Andy Warhol, and even asked Fiden, listen lady, how would you know what a real gun looked like? In a 2009 interview with James Barron of the New York Times, Fiden said that she knew Salonis intended to kill Warhol but could not prevent it.
FAS additionally cites Assistant District Attorney Roderick Lankler's handwritten notes on the case, written on June 4, 1968, which begin with Margot Fiden's stage name, Margot Eden, address, and telephone numbers at the top of the page. Late that day, Salonis arrived at the factory and waited outside. Morrissey arrived and asked her what she was doing there, and she replied, I'm waiting for Andy to get money. Morrissey tried to get rid of her by telling her that Warhol was not coming in that day, but she told him she would wait. At 2 p.m. she went up into the studio. Morrissey told her again that Warhol was not coming in and that she had to leave. She left, but rode the elevator up and down until Warhol finally boarded it. She entered the factory with Warhol, who complimented her on her appearance as she was uncharacteristically wearing makeup. Morrissey told her to leave, threatening to beat the hell out of her and throw her out otherwise. The phone rang and Warhol answered while Morrissey went to the bathroom. While Warhol was on the phone, Salonis fired at him three times. Her first two shots missed. But the third went through both lungs, his spleen, stomach, liver, and esophagus. She then shot art critic Mario Amaya in the hip. She tried to shoot Fred Hughes, Warhol's manager, in the head, but her gun jammed. Hughes asked her to leave, which she did, leaving behind a paper bag with her address book on a table. Warhol was taken to Columbus Mother Cabrini Hospital, where he underwent a successful five-hour operation. Later that day, Salonis turned herself in, gave up her gun, and confessed to the shooting, telling a police officer that Warhol had too much control in my life. She was fingerprinted and charged with felonious assault and possession of a deadly weapon. The next morning, the New York Daily News ran the front page headline, Actress Shoots Andy Warhol. Salonis demanded a retraction of the statement that she was an actress. The Daily News changed the headline in its later edition and added a quote from Salona stating, I'm a writer, not an actress. At her arraignment in Manhattan Criminal Court she denied shooting Warhol because he wouldn't produce her play, but said, it was for the opposite reason, that, he has a legal claim on my works. Salonis told the judge that, it's not often that I shoot somebody. I didn't do it for nothing. Warhol had tied me up, lock, stop and barrel. He was going to do something to me which would have ruined me. She told the judge she wanted to represent herself, and she declared that she was right in what I did. I have nothing to regret. The judge struck her comments from the court record, and had her admitted to Bellevue Hospital for psychiatric observation. Trial after a cursory evaluation, Salonis was declared mentally unstable and transferred to the prison ward of Elmhurst Hospital. Salonis appeared at New York Supreme Court on June 13, 1968. Florence Kennedy represented her and asked for a writ of habeas corpus, arguing that Salonis was being held inappropriately at Elmhurst. The judge denied the motion and Salonis returned to Elmhurst. On June 28, Salonis was indicted on charges of attempted murder, assault, and illegal possession of a gun. She was declared incompetent in August and sent to Matawan State Hospital for the criminally insane. That same month, Olympia Press published the Scum Manifesto with essays by Giridia and Krasner. In January 1969, Salonis underwent psychiatric evaluation and was diagnosed with chronic paranoid schizophrenia. In June, she was finally deemed fit to stand trial. She represented herself without an attorney and pleaded guilty to reckless assault with intent to harm. She was sentenced to three years in prison, with one year of time served. After murder attempt, the shooting of Warhol propelled Salonis into the public spotlight, prompting a flurry of commentary and opinions in the media. Robert Mar Morstein, writing in The Village Voice, declared that Salonis has dedicated the remainder of her life to the avowed purpose of eliminating every single male from the face of the earth. Norman Mailer called her the ropes peer of feminism. T. Grace Atkinson, the New York chapter president of the National Organization for Women, 
described Salonis as the first outstanding champion of women's rights and a heroine of the feminist movement and smuggled her manifesto out of the mental hospital where Salonis was confined. According to Betty Friedan, the NOW board rejected Atkinson. Atkinson left NOW and started another feminist organization. According to Friedan, the media continued to treat T. Grace as a leader of the women's movement, despite its repudiation of her. Another NOW member, Florence Kennedy, called Salonis one of the most important spokeswomen of the feminist movement. English professor Dana Heller argued that Salonis was very much aware of feminist organizations and activism, but had no interest in participating in what she often described as a civil disobedience lunch and club. Heller also stated that Salonis could reject mainstream liberal feminism for its blind adherence to cultural codes of feminine politeness and decorum which the scum manifesto identifies as the source of women's debased social status. Salonis and Warhol After Salonis was released from the New York State Prison for Women in 1971, she stalked Warhol and others over the telephone and was arrested again in November 1971. She was subsequently institutionalized several times, and then drifted into obscurity. The attack had a profound impact on Warhol and his art, and security at the factory scene became much stronger afterward. For the rest of his life, Warhol lived in fear that Salonis would attack him again. It was the cardboard Andy, not the Andy I could love and play with, said close friend and collaborator Billy Name. He was so sensitized you couldn't put your hand on him without him jumping. I couldn't even love him anymore, because it hurt him to touch him. Later Life Salonis may have intended to write an eponymous autobiography. In a 1977 Village Voice interview, she announced a book with her name as the title. The book, possibly intended as a parody, was supposed to deal with the conspiracy that led to her imprisonment. In a corrective 1977 Village Voice interview, Salonis said the book would not be autobiographical other than a small portion, and that it would be about many things, include proof of statements in the manifesto, and would deal very intensively with the subject of bullshit but she said nothing about parody. In the mid-1970s, in New York City, according to Heller, Salonis was, apparently homeless, continued to defend her political beliefs in the Scum Manifesto, and, actively promoted, her new manifesto revision, Ultraviolet. According to her somewhat unreliable report, interviewed her, Salonis was then known as Onslo. Salonis stated that the August 1968 version of the manifesto had many errors, unlike her own printed version of October 1967, and that the book had not sold well. She also said that, until told by Violet, she was unaware of Warhol's death. Death On April 25, 1988, at the age of 52, Salonis died of pneumonia at the Bristol Hotel in the Tenderloin district of San Francisco a building superintendent at the hotel, not on duty that night, had a vague memory of Salonis. Once, he had to enter her room, and he saw her typing at her desk. There was a pile of typewritten pages beside her. What she was writing, and what happened to the manuscript remain a mystery. Her mother burned all her belongings posthumously. Popular Culture Solonis' life has been the focus of numerous performances, films, musical compositions, and publications. In 1996, actress Lily Taylor played Solonis in the film I Shot Andy Warhol, which focused on Solonis' assassination attempt on Warhol. Taylor won special recognition for outstanding performance at the Sundance Film Festival for her role. The film's director, Mary Heron, requested permission to use songs by The Velvet Underground, but was denied by Lou Reed, who feared that Salonis would be glorified in the film. Six years before the film's release, Reed and John Cale included a song about Salonis, I believe, on their concept album about Warhol, Songs for Drella. In, I believe, Reed sings, I believe life's serious enough for retribution. I believe being sick is no excuse. And I believe I would have pulled the switch on her myself.
Reed believed Salonis was to blame for Warhol's death from a gallbladder infection 20 years after she shot him. Solonis' life has inspired three plays. Valerie Shoots Andy, by Carson Kreitzer, starred two actors playing a younger and an older Salonis. Tragedy and Nine Lives, by Karen Huppert. Examine the encounter between Salonis and Warhol as a Greek tragedy and starred Juliana Francis as Salonis. Most recently, in 2011, Pop, a musical by Maggie Kate Coleman and Anna K. Jacobs, focused mainly on Warhol. Rachel Zampelli played Salonis and sang, Big Gun, described as the, evening's strongest number, by the Washington Post. Up Your Ass was rediscovered in 1999, and produced in 2000 by George Coates' performance works in San Francisco. The copy Warhol had lost was found in a trunk of lighting equipment owned by Billy Name. Coates learned about the rediscovered manuscript while at an exhibition at the Andy Warhol Museum marking the 30th anniversary of the shooting. Coates turned the piece into a musical with an all-female cast. Coates consulted with Solonis' sister, Judith, while writing the piece, and sought to create a very funny satirist out of Solonis, not just showing her as Warhol's attempted assassin. Swedish author Sarah Strydesberg wrote a semi-fictional novel about Salonis called Drumfei Kultiten. The books narrate a visit Salonis toward the end of her life at the Bristol Hotel. Strydesberg was awarded the Nordic Council's Literature Prize for the book. Composer Pauline Oliveros released, to Valerie Salonis and Marilyn Monroe in recognition of their desperation, in 1970. In the work Oliveros seeks to explore how both women seemed to be desperate and caught in the traps of inequality. Monroe needed to be recognized for her talent as an actress. Salonis wished to be supported for her own creative work. There is a music group from Belgium called the Valerie Salonis. Salonis was featured in a 2017 episode of the FX series American Horror Story, Cult. Valerie Salonis died for your sins, scumbag. She was played by Alina Dunham. The episode portrayed Salonis as the instigator of most of the Zodiac Killer murders. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries. Would you like to know more?